the, the thing I would like you to think about when I give you these remarks is how a group of people who each had interests that were divergent and not necessarily the same came together and recognized that there was a greater good and each of them had to give up something to allow that greater good to be accomplished. That's the story I'm going to tell you about tonight. And uh, Larry, again, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, alumni, and President Hendricks. President Hendricks, I'll speak to the screen because I think you're going to talk to me later tonight. <laughs> it takes the cooperation of all of us to make a good fundraising effort. It takes the cooperation of all of us to make Mansfield the university we want it to be. And uh, for those who are not here, and for those of you who are here, this is the message I wish to deliver. When Mindy asked me to make a few remarks, I was surprised, humbled, and tremendously honored. I cannot express enough the pride I feel in being asked to help commemorate the Foundation's 40th anniversary, to recognize its accomplishments, and to thank each of you. It has been through your efforts the Foundation has grown to become the success it is. I hate to give prepared remarks, but I think in this one instance, Rod, you're going to have to bear with me, because I think otherwise, as Gail Largy will point out, I will miss the important things, and what's the deal then? As a way of beginning, <laughs> as a way of beginning, and Larry's told you this, I wish to remember and speak of one of Mansfield University's former great presidents. Some of you in this room may remember. Mr. James Morgan. Yes. Mr. Morgan came to Mansfield in 1921 and held many positions before he became president of Mansfield State Teachers College in 1943. He was very fond of Mansfield students and could often be heard quoting from various writings of the late 19th century philosopher, psychologist, physician, and optimist William James. He often told his students through his class in the lectures, and I quote, the great use of life is to spend it for something that will outlast it. Think about that. And let me repeat it. The great use of life is to spend it on something that will outlast it. President Morgan was very fond of that. He felt this philosophy was so important, went to the entire mission of what Mansfield State Teachers College was attempting to achieve in that era. <clears throat> that was to produce the next generation of great teachers, those individuals who would touch and form the foundation of the generation of which I am a part. I'm extremely proud that my mother, class of 1938, was one of those individuals influenced by President Morgan. She graduated with a degree in elementary education and taught for many years. She and my father, a local dentist, who probably treated some of you, raised a family of successful children while for numerous years also served as Secretary of the Board of Trustees for Mansfield University. It was through that generation of teachers who influenced most of, this, most of us in this room, through their direction and guidance, this community and this university have become the successes they are today. And they stand as a monument to those who came before us. Truly, they were, as Tom Brokaw wrote, the greatest generation. The year was 1972. I was working in an investment banking firm in Washington, D.C., when Ruth Marsh, who at that time was the alumni director of Mansfield State College, and my third grade teacher, I might add, <laughs> contacted me about serving on the Alumni Association Board. I was pleased, honored, and obviously accepted her invitation. It was quite a learning experience for a variety of reasons. First, traditions are extremely hard to break. I was constantly being reminded we have always done it that way. And the second and most important lesson, and it's a lesson I don't want anyone to forget, was that Mansfield as a state college was and is owned by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Other than the tuition paid by students, the college relied on the state for its existence. If there was a financial problem, <clears throat> want too many pages here, guys. It was a state's problem. They own it, they should fix it. They would ask, why should I support the college in donations? I pay taxes. To pay more would be double taxation. The year 1972 also saw a change in state government with Milton Schapp sworn in as governor of Pennsylvania 
and John Pittenger appointed as Secretary of Education. A commission was formed by Secretary Pittenger to study and eventually allow the formation of foundations to benefit the state colleges in areas where the state could not by law. Guidance was loose and several of the early foundations found themselves in trouble with state auditors over the handling of donations and expenses. Enter Dr. Lawrence Park. Dr. Park served as president from MSC from 1968 to 1977. He saw creating a foundation as an opportunity and he took advantage of it. The Alumni Association, like many nonprofit organizations at that time, did not feel the need to worry about the IRS. Nor had it ever registered with the IRS or the state as a nonprofit. That was obviously a problem. The Alumni Association dates back to 1871. And I'm sure it never occurred to anyone over the years that maybe something regarding tax status should be considered. Dues each year were $3 per alumnus and had been for years. <clears throat> the total assets of the association were approximately $33,000. Think about that relationship to what we're talking about today. The good news was the sitting judge of Tyler County was a Mansfield alumnus and also president of the Mansfield State College Alumni Association, Judge Robert Cla Camp, Kemp, excuse me, class of 1949. And that one article back there explains Bob's role in this. Bob asked me to look into the matter, which was fortuitous for a variety of reasons. One, it provided the association with an opportunity to correct the tax problem. The solution being to seek tax status as a tax exempt 501c3 organization whose purposes were essentially the same as the Alumni Association. At the same time, the college saw a foundation as an opportunity to create a vehicle that could offer financial opportunities that could not be provided for by the Commonwealth. It soon became apparent the solution was to merge these two concepts together and form a new entity called the Mansfield Foundation. Now came the hard part, convincing the Alumni Association of the need to accept this idea. Judge Kemp and I set Alumni Day of 1974 as the date to present this idea to the entire membership of the Alumni Association. We asked their approval to dissolve the Alumni Corporation and turn all of those assets over to the Mansfield Foundation. I will never forget Judge's Kemp, Judge Kemp's introduction when he said to the audience, I'm not really sure why we're doing this, but I'm sure Paul will explain. <laughs> if that didn't set the stage for debate, I don't know what would. But here's where I believe that growing up in Mansfield, by attending MSC, and by working with these alums and administrators since my youth, I was able to overcome that opposition, and the decision once presented and explained was accepted, and the decision was based on two principles. Number one, the Alumni Association had a potential tax problem, and number two, the university and the Alumni Association wanted to have all gifts recognized by donors as tax deductible. Once these two points were explained, the association voted to turn all the assets over to the foundation once it had received its nonprofit status, and number two, to reincorporate as a nonprofit membership organization. Here, two other individuals need to be mentioned, Mr. Ed Trainer and Dr. Sandy Talaferro Link. Ed was the chief financial officer for the college while Sandy was president of the faculty council. Ed handled the application with the IRS while Sandy worked with the faculty, showing them the benefits a foundation could bring. I was to work with the Alumni Association in the process of turning their assets over to this newly formed foundation and helping them to reincorporate. The three of us became the incorporators of the Mansfield Foundation with Sandy serving as president and I was serving as vice president. Shortly thereafter, the foundation received its provisional status as a 501c3 nonprofit. That designation was paramount then and still is vitally important because it provides the ability to inform donors that their gifts are tax deductible. And number two, allow these assets to remain separate from assets of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and also from the university. Think about that. The Alumni Association would continue in its role providing alumni programs funded by the foundation while the foundation would develop its mission on how best to serve the needs of all the Mansfield State College community. On reflection, it was one of those amazing times in life through the cooperation and unselfish actions, actions of so many parties, great things came together all at the same time. The college administration, through Dr. Park, 
and the college's board, Council of Trustees, or Board of Trustees at that time, agreed to advance this opportunity, giving up control of monies that they might rightfully have argued was theirs. The Alumni Association supported this vision by dissolving and turning over all their assets to this new foundation. You know, quite amazing when you stop and think about it. When there's so many parochial interests that everybody seems to have these days, a group of people of a singular mind could come together and advance a concept that was so beneficial to this great university. The years 1974 through 1976 saw the foundation establish itself and recruit and form its first board of directors. Additionally, a university search was held for a director of development, alumni affairs. I was hired in February of 1976 as director of development, alumni affairs. And Mendy, additionally, I held the position of executive director, not only of the Mansfield Foundation, but executive director of the Alumni Association, and I was the chief advancement officer for the university. All three positions wrapped into one person, advancing the interests of this great university. I joined the administration of the college reporting to Dr. Park. Soon after, I learned exactly why the foundation was necessary. Along with providing support for the Alumni Association, the foundation became a much needed means of funding various programs and publications for alumni and the entire college community. Since it was February, and the state's fiscal year operated on a July 1 through June 30 timetable, no money had been allocated in the development budget for much of anything. I took the problem to Larry Park, and he told me to go, you know what, <laughs> find it somewhere else. <laughs> the Alumni Association, through the foundation, came to the rescue and backed that initial rewrite of the Mansfield yet. That was the first example of what the foundation had the power to achieve in providing support where the state could not. With the support, my very good friend, photographer, writer, Bruce Dart, class of 1968, and Mrs. Mrs. Phyllis Swinsey, class of 1930. Some of you know all these people, a gifted proofreader and editor. We were off and running. Phyllis's son, Bob, was uh, director of Dean of uh, Teacher Education at that same time. The next challenge was the annual giving campaign. A goal of $50,000, $50,000, was set for academic year 1976-1977. This became another great lesson for which I found myself totally unprepared. I was amazed at how many friends, alumni, and other individuals who I thought would support this effort absolutely refused. <laughs> Citing over and over the belief that the state owns the college, they often refused to contribute, and if they did, they flew back to the $3 level. But at the same time, it was amazed by how many supporters there were. Alumni and friends became the nucleus. It was James, Dr. James Stacy Coles, class of 1934, former president of Bowdoin College, who taught me the fundamentals of fundraising. One of the points he made was to have a successful campaign, you need to recruit board members who had money, <laughs> controlled money, or were in the position to raise it and then would contribute it. He continued told me, and I quote, Paul, it was always easy to find someone who will tell you what to do with the money you raise, as long as they didn't have anything to do with the raising. <laughs> Another interesting point. I remember some of the first donors, Mr. Jim White, class of 1949, who established the Jonathan George Marsh Fund. Tom Holleran, class of 1955, who established the Holleran Fund. Dr. Marcella Hyde. All these individuals, they became great board members, advisors, and contributors. And then the corporate community joined in. First Citizens Bank and Trust Company, Commonwealth Bank and Trust Company, Ralph Evans' Ford dealership, and many others. Another endowment establishing the Blasberg Scholarship Fund. Think about this. You would say to yourself, what's so hard about this? But to get a community to turn their scholarship fund over to this foundation would not have been possible without the support of friends like Bob Dalton and Bob Jones. And Carol's daughter, and Bob's daughter Carol, I think, is a university trustee, or was. The foundation engaged in numerous activities in those early years. It was through the efforts and mission state, it was through these efforts, the mission statement and purpose of the Mansfield Foundation slowly developed. Programs such as the Mansfield Festival Theater applied for and received grants from both the foundation and Pennsylvania Council of the Arts. The foundation administered all of the university's non-credit courses, which otherwise may not have been possible because the college did not have the means or ability to pay faculty outside of the union contract. If the college wanted to offer a non-credit recreation course, it would have been required to pay the faculty member at the appropriate union scale. But through the foundation, expenses could be meant 
rent was paid to the college, stipend was paid to the instructor, and administrative fee came to the foundation for its efforts. Working in conjunction, Gail Argy, with the Northern Tier Regional Planning Commission, long-term planning documents were developed for the, the entire Northern Tier of Pennsylvania. And who on the payroll of Mansfield State College will ever forget the state budget impact in 1978? Faculty that were there in 1978, budget impasse, you didn't get paid. The failure of Pennsylvania's General Assembly to reach budget accord resulted in the college's inability to meet its payroll obligations. First Citizens Bank and Trust Company, through Bank President Richard Howe, Dick Howe, good friend, facilitated a loan to the foundation to meet the college's payroll through the entire month of July. This was provided not only in good faith, with no collateral, but also with no interest charged. At the time when interest rates were extremely high, this gesture was not only unheard of, but created a tremendous link between town and campus. This is, again, is an example of what the foundation could accomplish, but the college as a state institution could not. The foundation developed programs to help faculty pay space, payroll checks over 26 pay periods, so they were paid throughout the calendar year, offered scholarships, athletic support, and remember when the Mansfield College marching band went to London to perform? The foundation, again, was right there to assist. These are but a few examples of what the foundation could and did accomplish. These projects and activities define the foundation mission as an organization created and operated to assist the college in endeavors they had difficulty accomplishing on their own due to their status as state-owned. 1980, I left the college for a position in Harrisburg, a position I have held, held for 32 years as president of the Pennsylvania Automotive Association. 2004, using the knowledge and experience gained from Mansfield and other boards I've served on, I started the PAA Foundation a public charity community foundation. Today's assets to that foundation are 50 million, and I hope by next week to be over it. I continue to serve as his president and his chief and his primary fundraiser. The years after I left Mansfield are really where the Mansfield University Foundation story takes off. 1983, I think Act One took place, and the name was changed to Mansfield University Foundation shortly thereafter. Before I left. I hate to say this, my good friend, my mentor, Mr. Rod Kelchner, was appointed Vice President for Advancement, Development, and subsequently President of the University. Rod and I have debated for years over just about everything, and the history of North Hall is just one of them. And I'm delighted to say his vision, his direction, and his fortitude are what have made that building the success it is. Rod recognized it, recognized it wasn't enough to just raise unrestricted dollars for the university but a purpose must be attached. That purpose was the restoration of North Hall. He led the campaign both on a state legislative level with the help of House member Freddie Noy. Fred was class of 1968, <clears throat> and through gifts made to the Mansfield Foundation for that purpose. And looking at that building today and, and being as proud as I am of you, Rod, I have to say, Rod, job well done. Tonight, Tonight and today, we look back at the success of the Mansfield University Foundation's fundraising efforts. From alumni dues of $3 to an initial $50,000 campaign to this past year's campaign where over $1.2 million was raised, an achievement that can be attributed to the audience in this room and to the leadership provided by good friend Joe Moresco, current president Bob Shore, to executive director Mindy Angle and her team, and all the various board members and hopefully the President Hendricks and his advancement team. The many small gifts, the many large gifts, the many endowments, both those started this year and previously all helped lead to that success. When the foundation was first proposed in 1974, the parties involved had to recognize the importance of what each of them brought to this equation. A successful annual giving campaign works because all constituencies affected work as one. Together, they can achieve a success not obtainable individually. All members of the university community must recommit and recognize the importance of the Mansfield University and the role it plays in making Mansfield University the finest institution it can be. In closing, I think I understand the reason Mr. Morgan was so fond of William James's quote, the great use of life is to spend it on something that will outlast it. The Mansfield University Foundation and each of you, through your leadership, your gifts, your time, and your endowments, have established a legacy that will continue to grow and provide ongoing support and assistance to Mansfield University for years to come. 
Truly, the foundation your lives have gained meaning that will forever endure. To the many of us gathered here tonight, celebrating this great occasion and recognizing the tremendous benefits this foundation to provides to this great university, I thank you for allowing me to have played a small part in the formation of an idea that started as a dream and has now become a reality. I always will remain hopeful that the university will continue to develop, flourish, and be the great institution so many of us have come to call home. Thank you. <laughs>